Hello, I'm Anushka Joblikar. I am a, a PhD student in the Tilgner lab at Weill Cornell Medicine, and today I'm going to be talking to you about alternative splicing patterns in single cells across brain regions and development. So I don't need to tell you how splicing works, but I do want to emphasize that alternative splicing leads to distinct proteins being formed, and that vastly expands the proteome complexity, thereby leading to humans being slightly more complex than the worm. And if that hasn't convinced you, another reason why this is important is because, for example, the short isoform of the CD33 gene is neuroprotective in cases of Alzheimer's disease, while the longer isoform is neurotoxic. Alternative splicing can be region-specific, meaning that two different isoforms of the same gene can be expressed in the gut versus the brain, which can thereby lead to downstream regulatory effects. It is region-specific uh, within a single organ, and especially complex organs such as the brain or the heart. And furthermore, it is cell type specific within, um, again, these complex organs such as the brain or the heart. So the best way to study anything at a single cell level is to do droplet-based high-throughput single cell RNA sequencing. And again, I'm sure I don't need to tell you how droplet-based RNA-seq works, but one thing I do want to emphasize and that is overlooked is that droplet-based RNA-seq is a three-prime quantification method. What that means is if you were to actually look at the sequence um, that you get from an Illumina machine, you'd be able to trace back the barcode in your mind, therefore figure out exactly which cell each molecule comes from, but you wouldn't exactly be able to figure out the entire sequence of the gene because it's only sequencing the three prime end. Meaning, if we go back to our original cartoon, you'd be able to maybe distinguish between protein C and the other two, but you won't be able to differentiate between proteins A and B. So how do we overcome this? So our lab came up with a technique um, a few years ago whereby you keep the first part of the protocol the exact same. However, for the second part of the protocol, what we do is we reserve half the CD cDNA pre-fragmentation and we send it off for long read sequencing. What that means is because it's the exact same um, cDNA molecules sequenced on two different platforms, you can deconvolve the single cell barcodes to get exactly which cell each full length transcript comes from and resolve cell type specific isoforms. So we call this technique scissor seek, and you can read about it in our paper that we published in 2018. So we use this to study variability of isoform expression within and between brain regions. And for that, I chose the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus, two brain regions that are very important in memory and cognition. And we uh, did this at the P7 as in the postnatal day uh, seven time point. So the first question I asked is between two brain regions which have the same like homogeneous cell types, do we get the same isoform patterns? So what we found was that there's two main models that are followed. Model one is that all cell types investigated change splicing, and that is what contributes to this region-specific splicing. So here I'm showing you an example of a synaptic gene, NSFL1C. On the bottom, you see the gen code annotation, and on top, I'm going to show you per cell type what the reads are that map to this gene. So here, what you will notice is that this um, the PFC OPCs are only expressing one canonical form of the isoform with a certain degree of intron retention for this first intron. Um, the other cell types in the PFC are also expressing that same single isoform. However, what we find is that in the hippocampus, there is an addition of an exon it's a very small microexon, but it is present to varying degrees in all cell types of the hippocampus, meaning that probably it is microenvironment that is influencing splicing. And furthermore, what was really exciting to us is that microexons are supposed to be enriched in neuronal cell types, but that seems to not be the case. It seems to be kind of um, universal in the hippocampus. But this model is only followed by about 20% of the genes. The other 70 to 80% of the genes follow the more obvious model that one cell type changes splicing, and that is what is leading to this region-specific signal that we get. So in this example, 
a gene called hex a there's only one known um isoform for that gene and we find that that is what is expressed in the inhibitory neurons um, for the most part however in the excitatory neurons in the pfc you see a massive skipping of this exon and that uh that is implicated in nonsense mediated decay uh, which thereby play some sort of regulatory role. And we think this could have to do with some layer-specific cortical um, excitatory neurons, but we did not have the resolution to actually uh, study this to greater detail. Next, we looked at within region variability. So within the hippocampus, if you have multiple cell types, what are the isoform patterns? So of course, what we found was that the neurons are very different from non-neurons, and this is true for multiple um, um, degrees of granularity. However, what was really interesting was that the choroid plexus, which is this region right outside the hippocampus that is responsible for secreting cerebrospinal fluid, that is also really different from the rest of the non-neurons. So if you're looking at just the choroid plexus um, compared to the other non-neurons, Comparisons involving the choroid plexus have a really high percentage of DIE, which is like differential isoform expression. And what was more interesting is that it is usually the transcription start site, which is responsible for these differences. So again, this is not something that would have been picked up with regular single cell RNA sequencing. Looking further or zooming in more, if we look at neuronal subtypes, we find that excitatory neurons express predominantly this one shorter form of the FGF13 isoform, which is again a developmentally regulated gene, lethal when knocked out. And what we find is that um, the inhibitory neurons kind of modulate the use of both. When we overexpress these two exons, uh, sorry, isoforms, we find that the S isoform is localized to the nucleolus, whereas the Y isoform is in the cytoplasm, again, kind of consistent with its known roles. We validated our results even further by doing slide isoform sequencing, which is the same. Instead of using a homogenized tissue, we use um, tissue mounted on a slide. And then instead of having cell type specific isoforms, sorry for the typo, we have region specific isoforms here. And we see a clear spatial separation of neurons versus non-neurons. We don't have the resolution to do single cell um, um, differences, but we use the choroid plexus as a proxy for non-neurons, and the rest of the hippocampus is kind of a proxy for neurons because it is so densely packed with pyramidal cells. And we see this for two different genes, which are again developmentally regulated. And the most exciting result for me is that the SNAP25 gene, which um, has this developmental switch in its two isoforms with two mutually exclusive exons switching their use. Uh, you see a anterior to posterior gradient where you have SNAP25A expressed in the front, whereas B expressed in the back of the brain. So again, you can read more about this in our paper that was published last year. Um, however, what has been lacking in this is that this was only one brain region, and, uh, sorry, one time point and two brain regions. However, what we want to know is whether these patterns are universal, A, if we look across time, and B, if we look across space. So we've been collecting data for um, different time points um, in the mouse brain, and at P56, which is the adult time point, we have multiple brain regions. And the reason why we're asking these questions is because we know that at a gene expression level, excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons kind of cluster together regardless of their origin, as in like time point or brain region. However, this is not known like what happens when you're looking at splicing. So in order to answer that, we like I said, collected data, uh, single cell RNA-seq, across multiple time points and multiple brain regions. And again, I'm showing you a similar Spearman correlation plot to the dummy one I had before. And <clears throat> we're again seeing a very clear difference between neurons and non-neurons. So this upper corner here is neuronal cell types and bottom corner here is non-neuronal cell types. However, um, and However, if you look at this annotation on top, you will find that while the blue and red, which is glial cell types, are on the right, the age and the region sort of gets a little bit chaotic. And we, we, we want to find out what is leading 
to <clears throat> certain cell types being more similar to each other than not when it comes to their splicing profile. So what we did was we took different samples, so cell type, region, and age, and compared them in a pairwise fashion to each other. And if they passed a certain threshold for splicing difference, we call them highly variable. So I'm going to show you a circus plot of highly variable exons um, for all of these different comparisons. And what we'll find is that <clears throat> the the brain regions are on the outside and then the inner concentric circle are their different cell types. They're colored by the different brain regions. So the first thing I notice is that the within brain region um, connections are really thick, whereas the between brain regions are fewer and also they're thinner, meaning that they're probably not as, um, as widespread. And the second thing I notice is that in the developmental time point where you have the developmental time points on the outside concentric circles and the brain regions and the cell types on the inside, what we're finding as is that the lines that are between um, P28 are way thicker than the others. So basically what we're seeing is that P28 is kind of an outlier when it comes to development and we're finding that brain region, like um, the, the differences that are occurring within a brain region are stronger than between. So this is just the same information in a bar plot format where I'm showing that transitions across brain regions are fewer and less frequent than the ones within. And additionally, an, an, an interesting finding was that exon variability is higher when it comes to developmental time points in blue than in adult time points, which is in red. Um, zooming in even further into not just highly, but extremely highly variable exons, again, to try and like reduce our universe a little bit, what we find is that they're organizing themselves very neatly into different um, categories. So either you have exons that are very developmental specific or cell type specific, um, so on and so forth, and these can then be probed further to see what their functional relevance is. I'm just showing an example of a developmentally regulated gene where you have two exons of that same gene, which shows similar um, increasing patterns of um, exon inclusion in oligodendrocytes, but in excitatory neurons it shows like different fluctuating patterns. So all this was well and good in the mouse brain. However, what we really want to know is whether these results can be extrapolated to humans. However, there are many different challenges in obtaining isoform information from human tissue. Primarily is the fact that human brain tissue is usually obtained frozen. So one workaround is to try using single nuclei instead of single cell sequencing. However, as you guys may know, single nuclei sequencing is, um, or nuclear RNA is, are usually unspliced. So when we actually get molecules sequenced on the, on a long read sequencer, there's three types of molecules generated. One is the kind that we actually like, barcoded and spliced, but there's two other types, which are artifacts. A um, is an artifact of 10x, sorry, three is an artifact of 10x, and two is just um, intronic barcoded DNA. So how do we get around it? We developed a technique called snizzer sequencing, single nuclei um, isoform RNA sequencing, where we employ lap cap. Lap cap is um, linear asymmetric PCR, which enriches for barcoded molecules, followed by exome capture, which um, enriches for exonic molecules. And we applied it to two adult human cortical samples, and we found that there is actually a 7.5 fold improvement in our barcoded and on target rate without any loss of like real information. So what that means is that a $35,000 experiment is now costing $5,000, which is more tractable and you can sequence more samples. So we wanted to use that to gain insight into um, exon inclusion variability. So here I'm just looking at the different levels of um, exon inclusion across different cell types. So the first thing I did was look at disease-associated exons. So we looked at um, ALS, ASD, which is um, autism spectrum disorder, and schizophrenia, and as a sanity check, we made, make, made sure that um, there is no variability in gene expression. 
However, when you look at the exon variability, there is a pretty high, like significant difference when you look at the ASD specific exons. This is just a heat map showing that same information. And this is important because if you were to try and sort for, say, um, astrocytes and look for ASD specific markers, that would be an okay thing to do. But if you were to try and look for astrocyte specific things and ALS or, or schizophrenia, that would kind of be an exercise in futility. We also, first, we have adjacent exons or distant exons, and they can either be mutually associated or they can be mutually exclusive. When I'm just going to show you a cartoon of what happens. So if you see exon coordination patterns in pseudobulk, what we often find is that those same patterns are recapitulated in different cell types, maybe to different um, degrees. And this is a pie chart showing um, how many cell types um, an exon coordination pattern is observed and a lot of times it's it's seen in multiple cell types however when you look at distantly coordinated exons they have very cell type specific patterns so they will have like an astrocytic pattern and a microglial pattern which in pseudo bulk seems like they're coordinated but here it seems like they are um, just constitutively expressed in that single cell type so here's an example. Again, these are autism-associated exons, which are distant, and they're coordinated in, um, like, overall. But when you look at neuronal cell types, they're always included. And when, they're, when you look at glial cell types, they're always excluded. And we validated this using qPCR. And one cool fact was that when you look at exon and site pairs, um, so that can be TSS and exon or poly and exon. They behave very similarly to the distant coordinated exon pairs where they become cell type specific. So just to contrast it with the previous heat map, there's a lot more green in this versus a lot more pink in this. So basically, if you're looking at um, combination patterns, adjacent exons are the outliers, um, whereas distant exons, exons and TSS, and exon and poly A sites are more cell type specific. So um, last little bit, if you're looking at all of these things in human and all of these things in mice, can we make statements about whether or not these cell type specific patterns, for example, are they conserved between the two different species? So surprisingly, what we find is that if you're looking at exons that are found to be alternative in either species, a majority of the exons that are human, like alternative in human, are actually constitutive in mouse. So here I'm showing a heat map where you have three different clusters that are formed. Cluster one is exons that are alternative in both. Cluster two is exons that are pretty alternative in human, but almost always constitutively included in mice. And the third is a converse. So when we look at the exons that are um, alternative in human versus alternative in both, what we find is that they are generally longer and they also don't preserve the coding frame as often as um, the other ones do. And additionally, what we find is that um, if you look at the fast con scores of the exons that are alternative in human, they are a little bit like lower, meaning that they may be a little bit newer when it comes to evolution. And um, when you look at the, the region flanking that exon, that is also true. So it just seems to be like these are newly formed um, uh, formed sequences. So again, I don't have much time to go into this. We're still trying to figure it out and really map out a um, cell type specific like map between species. Um, keep your eyes peeled for a preprint in the next few months. And please come talk to me if you have any questions about this. I will also be presenting a poster on the same stuff. With that, I'd like to thank my lab, um, a lot of different labs and collaborators without whom uh, none of this work would have been really possible, my funding sources, and the Brain Initiative for the um, spatio-temporal aspect of this. Thank you.